Good morning. Our first reading today is from 1 Chronicles 13, verses 1 to 14. So that's on page 310 of our Bibles. David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of your people throughout the territories of Israel, and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all the people. So David assembled all Israel from the river Shehor in Egypt to Lebo Hamath to bring the ark of God from kiriath Jiriam. David and all Israel went to Bala of Judah, kiriath Jiriam, to bring up from there the ark of God the Lord, who is enthroned between the cherubim, the ark that is called by the name. They moved the ark of God from Abinanab's house on a new cart with Uzzah and Ahio guiding it. David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God with songs and with harps and lyres and tambourines, cymbals and trumpets. When they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah and he struck him down because he had put his hand on the ark. So he died before, uh, there before God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of God that day and asked, how could I ever bring the ark of God to me? He did not take the ark to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house for three months, and the Lord blessed his house, household and everything he had. The second reading is taken from John 4, uh, verses 19 to 26, and it's on page 802 of our Bibles. Okay, so, sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when we will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for, sal for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. Juliet, thank you very, very much. And good morning, everyone. Hello. Welcome to Christchurch Ballon, but this is your first time here. And uh, we've been going through this book of Chronicles, and we've only got two weeks left um, before the end of this, mini, uh, end of this series. Um, so I'm really excited to, uh, to share this passage with you. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for already um, what we've heard of you this morning, what we've been reminded of you. You are the Holy God, and yet you love us. And Lord, this is a complicated passage, and we scratch our heads at it, and yet we know it's all about Jesus. And I pray, Father, that meeting Christ in this scripture would fill us with confidence and fill us with love. And I pray, Father, that uh, we wouldn't fall asleep because of the heat. Keep us awake, Lord. Keep us alert that we might hear the voice of your spirit. Amen. I don't know if you've ever done this thing on Google where you start typing a, a question or a phrase into Google and then based on your past search history or, or the search histories of myriads of other people around the planet, Google attempts to predict what your question's going to be. I don't know if you ever played this game. I played it this week. So for example, I began to type, where do I go to find? And the first hit was, I've lost my passwords. And the next thing I, I typed, where do I go to meet? Answer, 
new friends. Third question, how do I discover, and it was guessing that I was after my talent, which is interesting. So Google clearly thinks my past history, I am most, I'm hopeless, I'm friendless, and I'm talentless. Um, <laughs> Which, uh, which is not very reassuring. Well, well the passage, we're, uh, the question we're, we're asking this morning is where do we go to meet God? And, and how can I discover his will? And if you're here today and you're just looking in on, on Christian things, perhaps this is the, these are the very questions you really want answering. You know, if there is a God who made me, uh, where do I go to meet him? Do I meet him here or do I meet him over there? You know, there's a myriad of options. Where, where should we go? And if he can be known, well, what, what does he want of me? If he wants anything at all. But even if you've been a Christian for years, I think these questions are still really relevant. Because in, in the course of our lives, we often feel the need to inquire of God, don't we? Often it's with the big stuff. Where should I live? Um, what job should I take? Should I marry? And we believe, don't we, that God is our loving, heavenly Father who wants the best for us. So it's natural, isn't it, for us to seek His mind to try and gain a sense of His direction. Now, this topic of decision making is huge, and I, I can't hope to possibly tackle it sufficiently this, in the time I have this morning. But it's fair to say that Christians have sometimes fallen into two camps, which are kind of often pitted against one another. Uh, they're, they're kind of two schools of thought. Um, one school of thought, and, and some Christians encourage us to inquire of God in prayer. Uh, typically, uh, they would say that we, we need to find the will of God. And by that, they mean uh, try and find out his sovereign will, so God's sovereign plan. The idea then is that God has a plan for our lives and we have to somehow work out and uncover what that plan might be and try to fall into that plan. Now, there are some potential downsides to this view and it it, it can lead to a whole lot of worrying and a whole lot of inactivity. Because because what if if the job I've taken is, is not... God's plan, what if I'm on the wrong plan? What if I'm on the wrong path? And Oh no, you see, I don't know if you've ever felt this way. I don't, uh, this satirical headline I came across this week kind of captures this view. Man, 91, dies waiting for the will of God. You probably can't read the article, it's too small, but it, apparently his wife said, he hung around the house and prayed a lot, but never got that confirmation. The other downside, I think, of inquiring of God in prayer is that it's pretty subjective, isn't it? It can potentially lead us to to bless every uh, decision we might make and think it's of God, even though it might be incredibly selfish. So again, another satirical headline I saw this week uh, captured this really well. Uh, The next satirical headline says, everything local man feels led to do, he coincidentally really likes. (laughs) So he feels the Lord to lead him to play golf at the weekend instead of perhaps worship with the Lord at his church. You know, the Lord's leading me this way. A potential downside. So the result of this, churches like ours, we tend towards the second view. And we tend to say, no, we we should inquire of God in his word. And we believe, so when when we talk about um, finding the will of God, we we typically mean God's revealed will. uh, What God has told us he likes and doesn't like. And and so um, the Bible, of course, doesn't tell me where I should live or who I should marry or what job I should take. And so we're free. We're liberated to basically make a, a decision within this broad orbit of obedience. So as long as I'm not hoping to be an assassin or marry my sister, I, I'm generally free. And that's a good thing. Very liberating. Two schools of thought. Now, I've only come to sort of think about this more recently but there are potential downsides to this second view because it can lead to a slightly unrelational way of thinking about God, that he only cares about decisions which are wrong or right, and he has no real interest in the detail of our lives. And It could lead to a rather mechanical view of prayer where, where we simply inform God of our decisions, which we've already made, as if he didn't know, and then ask him to essentially bless our decisions. 
But what, what father is there who doesn't care for the detail in his children's lives? What father wouldn't want to be consulted about big decisions? Now, speaking personally, I've seen the impact of this second way of thinking in, in my own life. At times, I've been so confident of my own plans and the rightness of my strategies that I've not even thought to ask God what he thinks of them. I just assumed he would bless them because they weren't morally wrong. Now, studying this book of Chronicles has resulted in this shift in thinking for me because inquiring of God or seeking God is pretty much the biggest repeated theme throughout the whole book. You could say it's the, the aim of the book. That the Chronicles read is my inquire of God, seek God. And yes, God, of course, God has revealed himself fully and finally in his word. Of course, that's true. But we must also inquire of God in prayer. Seek to put our questions to him. And so we shouldn't be pitting word or prayer against one another. Instead, we should have both. It should be word and prayer, as it says on the slide. So the first thing this passage teaches us is that we need to inquire of the Lord. So if you're following on your, on your service sheets, which do hand, doubly hand, uh, double up as a fan if you want to fan yourself or if you want to take notes, if that helps you stay awake in the heat, do that, please. But first, we're going to see the need to inquire of the Lord. So let's uh, pick it up. Chapter 13, verse 1 begins this way. David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide, literally in the Hebrew, let the word break out to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel and also to the priests and the Levites who are with them in the towns of Pastorans to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. The whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all of the people. Now, we're not going to make any headway on this passage at all unless we understand the significance of the ark. Now, on one level, it was just as you can see from the picture, it was just a box of wood overlaid with gold with some pretty angels on the top. But, but it was God's own design. And he gave this uh, design, he gave this ark to his people to signify three massive things about him. First thing it signifies is his rule, his rule over them and over all creation. In various places in the Psalms, for example, whenever the ark is mentioned, it's often described as the throne of God or the footstool of his throne. So it's a picture of his rule. It was also a picture of God's desire to be reconciled to his people. So you might know uh, once a year on the Day of Atonement, a priest would go to the ark and he would slaughter a goat and his blood would be thrown all over the ark of the covenant. It was picturing how God provides a sacrifice so that he might be able to live with his people. Rule, reconciliation. The third thing was is a picture of revelation. This was where God often spoke to his people. And so you might notice on the top of those two cherubim, those two angels, and they, they were called the two angels which guarded the Garden of Eden. You might remember them. So it, we, this is a picture. Here is where God dwelt. And it is from here that God makes his decrees. So you, you see, the ark is really, really important. But the problem then is that for much of King Saul's reign, this ark was completely ignored. Uh, David says in verse 3 how nobody inquired of God during that entire period. In fact, as you know, Saul inquired of mediums instead, which is why, as you see from the map behind me, God allowed the ark to be captured by the Philistines. And it kind of, on seven months, it went on this fun tour of Philistia going around and no one wanted it in their town because it caused a disaster amongst them. And they kept on carting it off to the next place and the next place and the next place. But now David's king and the first act as king is to bring the ark back 
to once again have God enthroned amongst them, to enjoy his rule, his reconciliation and his revelation. So David is presented as quite democratic, isn't he? He gets together with his army officers and says, what should we do, lads? And uh, they agree, let's bring the ark back. And then they send word out, break the word out to the rest of all of Israel. What do you think, everyone? And everyone thinks it's a great idea. And so they press forward with this plan. Pick it up, verse 5. So David assembled all Israel from the river Shehor in Egypt to Lebo Hamath to bring the ark of God from Kiriath-Jerim. David and all Israel went to Bala of Judah, that's Kiriath Jerim, to bring up from there the ark of the Lord, who is enthroned between the cherubim, the ark that is called by his name. Now, various places there, they're actually very, very significant. As you can see from this map, by the way, I've noticed this week, I'm going to be saying, as you can see from this map, about 20 times throughout this sermon. Um, as you can see from this map, after God's people left slavery in Egypt, God promised them this enormous land. Uh, You can see from the map, uh, the brook of Egypt right down in the extreme south, all the way to Lebo Hamath in the extreme north. But if you know the history, because of Israel's sin and their laziness and their fear, they never really did this. They, They only conquered a fraction of this land which God had promised them. But David, David here is presented as the king, the Christ who brings in the kingdom. So within this vast land over which David is now king, there is only one place where you could meet God. There's only one place, and that was in Jerusalem where the ark was. Now, the reason this is interesting for the chronicler, the reason why he's going on about this, is because this was a really live concern in his day for his readers. Um, being, uh, despite being back in the land after the exile for a few generations, there are still Jews scattered all over uh, the Middle East. Uh, it's still many in Assyria, many in Babylon. He wants them all from wherever they are, far and wide, to come back to worship God in Jerusalem. And if you know anything about this book of Chronicles, the reason why his emphasis is so much on the Jerusalem temple is because while he's writing this book, there was another temple being built. This one in Samaria on Mount Gerizim. And so there was this rival temple. So Jews from all over are going, well, where should we meet God? Should it be here in Jerusalem or should it be on this mountain in, 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 in Samaria? Where should we meet God? Now, again, this is a real live question. Even 400 years later, after the Chronicler, even in Jesus' day, you may have noticed our second reading, Jesus chatting with a Samaritan woman. And that is precisely her question. Where should we meet God? On this mountain, Gerizim? Or as you Jews say, in Samaria? Jesus surprises her by asking, by replying. He says, a time is coming when you'll worship God neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. I don't know if you've ever been uh, to Chartwell uh, House in Kent. Hands up if you're a National Trust member. Nerds. Uh, you know who you are. They always have hiking boots in their car, don't they? You can always spot them. And um, if you've been to Chartwell House in, uh, in, uh, in Kent, you'll know it was the previous residence of Winston Churchill, arguably our, our greatest Britain. And uh, if you walk around the house, you can see all these various art- artifacts uh, which sort of recall him. Um, his clothes his paintings, his, his famous cigars. And you can see these in the little cabinets. And as you, as you see these items, you do get a sense of this great man. But if you've heard, for argument's sake, if you've heard somehow that Winston Churchill was alive and well living in Balham, well, you wouldn't bother going to Chartwell House, would you? You wouldn't bother looking at, staring at some um, cigars in a mouldy cabinet when you could go and talk to the man himself and meet the man himself. Why go to the symbols of his presence when he could enjoy his presence? Makes no sense. Well, that's Jesus' point in John chapter 4. To meet God, we don't need to pilgrimage to a special land or to a special building. It's not about place anymore. It's about person. It's not about where. It's about Who? And in the end, the Samaritan woman thinks she knows 
who that person is. She says, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I am he. So again, if you're here today looking at non-Christian things, if you want to know, where do, I, where do I meet God? Well, here's an idea. Listen to God. He says, meet him in Jesus. Go to Jesus, God incarnate. Meet him there. We're going to circle back around to that idea later on, but let's just continue with our narrative. And it goes on to teach us that we must inquire of the Lord. We must lest he breaks out against us. Let's pick up story verse 7. They moved the ark of God from Abinadab's house on a new cart, with Uzzah and Ahio guiding it. David and all the Israelites were celebrating with all their might before God, with songs and harps and lyres and tambourines and cymbals and trumpets. You can can picture the scene, can't you? This vast procession of thousands upon thousands of Israelites going from uh, Kiriath-Jerim, as you see on the map here, um, uh, going from Kiriath-Jerim to to Jerusalem. Uh, It must have been an extraordinary scene. It kind of reminds me of uh, those pictures you often see of football uh, celebrations. Uh, this is um, what happened to Liverpool uh, when they came back uh, with the FA Cup. And, and it's just like the celebration, lining the streets, shouting, hollering. The Israelites no longer felt like losers. They felt like winners. Because God is with them. But then in a heartbeat, it all goes horribly wrong. Verse 9. When they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah and he struck him down because he had put his hand on or against the ark. So he died before God. I couldn't preach this passage and not mention Indiana Jones. Uh, If you've seen that film, uh, you'll know that when the the Nazis try and open up uh, the Ark of the Covenant, his face melts off. I went through various iterations of trying to freeze frame which picture, because it gets quite gruesome. And Johnny said, I can't show the face with it all melted. But but your faces are melting in its own heat. But but, but do you remember that's what happened? And um, we think, well, yeah, of course, he's a Nazi. (laughs) Uh, You know, holy God, Nazi. What's going to happen? Face melt. Um, But Uzzah, you know, he's, he's one of God's people, right? He's trying to be helpful. Oh, it's falling. Doesn't seem fair, doesn't it? One minute he's celebrating before God. Next minute we're told he dies before God. The million dollar question is why is God angry? Now I'm tempted to say come back next week and find out because we're not told. We're told in two chapters time in chapter 15 what went wrong. But I'm going to spoil it for you. Um, Because later... Chapter 15, David realizes what he did wrong. Ironically, he failed to inquire of the Lord. See, had he done that, or at least consulted the Levites who knew how the ark should be transported uh, instead of his army officers, if he consulted with them instead, he would have known that God has given very clear instructions about how the ark was to be transported. Uh, Previously, in Numbers chapter 4, God says that only consecrated Levites could carry the ark, and not just any old randomer like uh, Uzzah and Ahio here. Um, And they had to transport it reverently on these golden poles. Uh, They were not to transport it um, irreverently on an ox's cart, which is exactly how the Philistines carted around the ark when they had it in their territory. And, And nobody, nobody, was ever to touch the throne of God. It was, so, it was considered so holy because God is holy. Really clear instructions. But David was more concerned about the end goal, bringing the ark into Jerusalem, than he was about the means, how exactly it should be done. And so this rash plan of his, which broke out across Israel back in verse 2, Ironically, it results in God's anger breaking out against Uzzah. Verse 11. Then David was angry 
because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah, breaks out against Uzzah. David was afraid of God that day and asked, how, how can I ever bring the ark of God to me? He did not take the ark to be with him in the city of David. Now, I don't know what you make of this passage. Perhaps you kind of share David's confusion and anger. Maybe we struggle to square this with our understanding of what we think God is like. It might confirm your suspicion that God is um, petty, capricious, that he's got a hair trigger tempo. He's waiting to lash out and uh, hit someone. Maybe maybe that's what we think. Um, But the character of our creator hasn't changed between then and now. He has always been God Almighty. He's never been God Almighty. It reminds me of a news report I came across in 2017. There was an eclipse on the, on the west coast of, of the United States and California. And the U.S. government really kindly provided the residents who asked for it with these NASA-approved goggles. And NASA-approved goggles on, you can stare at the eclipse and enjoy it in all its beauty. But some people in California reasoned that applying sunscreen to the eyeballs would be a second best alternative. What was the result? Uh, apparently a number were hospitalized with eye-related injuries, having burned out their retinas. Idiots. <laughs> you think, what idiots? The sun will burn your eyes out from 92 million miles away. And yet we sometimes think we can casually stroll into the presence of its creator. We must worship God in the way he has directed because anything else will be spiritually lethal. And that's what the chronicler wants his readers to pick up. Uh, Some of them might have been drawn to Mount Gerizim. It's closer, it's more convenient. No, worship the God the way he has directed, the chronicler says. And that's what we need to pick up today. As we might think we have freedom to approach God however we like, on our own terms, casually, easily. No, we've got to worship God the way he has directed. And so David's question in verse 12, it expresses the big unresolved tension of the whole Old Testament. David asks, how can I bring the ark of God to me? In other words, how can this holy, holy, holy God, this burning holy God, how could he possibly live with us? That might be your question. If God really knows what my heart is like and the thoughts that run through my mind, how could he possibly live in me and with me? Well, God himself actually provides the solution to this question in himself. Jesus Christ is God, the holy God, the fearsomely holy God, incarnate. And if you read the Gospels, and I hope you have, you see that Jesus lived the most pure and holy life. He he always inquired of God the Father. And because of his purity, he could approach him with great confidence. And yet, what did he do? He deliberately went to the cross. And there, upon the cross, the Son of God. Well, you could say that the Father's anger broke out against him. In order that it wouldn't break out on us. It's like the opposite of King David. Uzzah died because of King David's sin. Jesus died because of our sin. And the result of this is that we can now approach God with confidence. We can have God enthroned among us and even by his Holy Spirit living in us. But only because of Jesus. He is the only way, the only divinely sanctioned way that we can be made right with God. So just to knock this out, idea into touch, the, the, um, God doesn't just go around as waiting for someone to smite. Yeah, you. You know, sometimes people have that idea of him. Rather, God's desire is the opposite. God is always looking to bless. 
And notice how that, that's what happens next. Notice chapter 13 ends this way. Verse 13, instead, he took the ark to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. I don't think people in Gittite sounded very nice, did they? Uh, the ark of the Lord remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house for three months. And the Lord blessed his household and everything he had. There's some debate about who exactly this Obed-Edom chap is. Um, some people think he's a Philistine. And David's kind of using him as a, as a guinea pig. It's like, oh, no, we can't have God enthroned here because he kind of anger breaks out. Well, let's put him with a Philistine. Yeah, we'll have him in his house and he'll take the flack. <laughs> but, so some people think he's a Philistine guinea pig. Other people think he's a Levite. And because there's another guy called Obed-Edom, who's a, whose name is repeated in coming chapters. My own view is that both are correct. I think Obed-Edom is an unclean Gentile Philistine. But as a result of God's mercy and grace and blessing, he gets adopted into the tribe of Ledite and and made an honorary Levitical gatekeeper. And if that's right, I I think it's a brilliant picture, a visual aid of what Christ has achieved for us, unclean Gentiles, that he's consecrated us. He's made us holy. He now dwells with us and forgives us and seeks to bless us. And that's where we're going to go next. You have to come back next week if you want to find out what happens with the Ark of the Covenant. And if you look, we're going to look at chapter 14 very briefly um, because it's kind of like a a dramatic interlude. At first reading, it might look like it's got absolutely nothing to do with the bit before it, but, but actually it continues the exact same theme. That's why I'm attempting to cover it all this morning. You see, we must inquire of the Lord, lest he break out against us, but also that he might break out for us. We're going to tackle this chapter really at pace because I'm aware it's warm. But we see here David breaking out to bless David in three different ways, with buildings, with babies, and with battles. Buildings, babies, battles, okay? All because he inquires of the Lord. So pick it up, 14, verse 1. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David along with cedar logs, stonemasons, and carpenters to build a palace for him. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that his kingdom had been highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. Now, as you can see from this map, ding, 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 you can see that Tyre is a, a Gentile city. It's famed for its, its wealth and its, its sea trade. And the fact that Tyre, the king of Tyre, wants to trade with David and wants to create this trade treaty with him indicates that he, re- he respects David as king. Now, now, if we're slightly worried that this sort of building of a palace is slightly opulent and, uh, and needlessly selfish, we're reminded here, aren't we, that David's purpose was for the sake of, of his people. Apparently, King Saul, during his reign, he never had a royal court. It's perhaps why his army was a complete shambles. But, but now that David has a palace, now that he, he has that, he can have a royal court. And from there, he can properly govern all the 12 tribes because he has representatives meeting with, with him in this court. And later, generations to come, the king of Tyre would also build the, uh, help build the, the, the temple in Jerusalem. So I think what the chronicle is doing here, he's reminding, he's reminding us that the purpose of God's rule is international blessing. And again, we see that ultimately fulfilled in Christ. As the good news extends, not just in, in, in the land of Israel, but to the ends of the earth. As here we are in Britain, 2,000 years later, and not the King of Tyre, but the Queen of England <laughs> acknowledges Jesus Christ as Lord. International blessing. In verse 3, we move on to babies. Verse 3, the chronicle records the next blessing. David's given loads and loads of children. And, and again, this is a huge contrast to Saul. You might remember when Saul was in battle against the, uh, the Philistines, all his sons died. His entire line was wiped out. But David's the opposite. David has given loads of children, an enormous lineage, which is a hope for the future. And again, the chronicler, he was writing, he was looking for for a future Davidic king. Where would it come from? 
Well, now there's hope because of the many Davidic descendants. And ultimately, one of them would be Jesus Christ. I hope, by the way, I hope you see how I'm trying to handle this passage. I hope this is instructive for you. What I'm not saying is that if you inquire of the Lord, if you inquire of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be blessed with buildings and babies. That would be a very irresponsible way to handle uh, God's word. <laughs> we not promise that. But I am saying that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are the blessing. Because you are the building. You are where God dwells. And you are his posterity. You are his children. Not by blood, but by faith. We are the blessing. Buildings, babies, battles. Verse 8. Clearly not everyone's very happy that David is king. Philistines aren't happy. Verse 8. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, they went up in full force to inquire for him. But David heard about it and went out to meet them. Now the Philistines had come and raided the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of God. Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, Go, I will deliver them into your hands. Now consider for a moment who David is. He has a vast amount of military experience which he could have trusted in. We met, saw in chapter 12, he has a huge military might, an army, which he could have trusted in. But having learned his lesson from the ark, David instead inquires of God. He asked the Lord in prayer, what shall I do? And look what happens. Verse 11. So David and his men went up to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. He said, as waters break out, God has broken out against my enemies by my hand. So that place was called Baal Perazim, another breakout location. The Philistines had abandoned their gods there and David gave orders to burn them in the fire. So remember the last time that the Israelites were in battle against the Philistines. Remember Saul had inquired of a medium. What was the result? Everyone died. Disaster. And his body was hung in the temple of their gods. But now, David, having inquired of the Lord, they have victory. And the Philistine gods are exposed as utterly worthless. In the end, only God's promised king can give victory. So I want to come back to where we started, those questions we've begun with. I think we're being invited to ask ourselves, will we rely on our resources on our strategies, on our strengths, on our plans. And, and, and just assume God will bless them because they're not disobedient or wrong. Or will we in humility inquire of the Lord and ask him what he thinks of them? If we aren't yet persuaded, just look at the second battle report. This just really hits the nail on the head. Verse 13, once more, the Philistines raided the valley. So David inquired of God again and God answered him, do not go directly after them, but circle around them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. Random tactic, God. As soon as you hear marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move out to battle because that will mean God has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. I'm sure a number of you know Bill Wilson. He's not here today, so I, I, I have to embarrass him. Um, a few years ago, we, we're, um, he and I were in a, in a preaching group when he was a minister up in Stockwell. We, we used to, he has to listen to my sermons each week and give me feedback and, uh, and vice versa. And I remember after one of these uh, preaching groups, um, I was talking about my various plans for CCB. Uh, all my brilliant strategies, what we're going to do, what we're going to do next. And Bill, being wise Bill, he sort of patiently listened and nodded. And then he said, I remember it very clearly, he said this, Andy, 
You're very good at thinking about where to move your tanks. But have you yet won the battle in the air? I didn't get the reference at all. He told me it was a reference for World War II, and particularly the Battle of Britain, which is the first ever aerial battle in human history. In the summer of 1940, the RAF fought against the Nazi Luftwaffe to get control of British uh, uh, aerospace. And as a result of that victory, the D-Day landings could happen. If we had lost that battle, most likely Hitler would have invaded Britain. The first battle to be won had to be in the air. See, that was God's lesson to David in his fight against the Philistines. The marching in the trees above his head told David that the Lord's army, the spiritual army, was going ahead of him whilst his earthly army were there below. The battle was therefore won, not with his might and his resources, but when David got down on his knees to inquire of God in prayer. I don't know about you, but I'm very thankful that we have a heavenly father. He doesn't only care about whether our decisions are morally wrong or morally right. We have a heavenly father who cares about the detail in our lives. He wants us to depend on him for the growth of his kingdom. To seek his wisdom as we make it a priority in our lives to extend the borders of his kingdom. To invite him to open or close doors accordingly to guide us perhaps through them. Because in the end, here's the thing guys, what do we want CCB to be known for? Honestly, what what do you want CCB to be known for? Do we want it to be known as a place where the Bible is preached faithfully and clearly? Do we want it to be known as a place where we worship God joyfully? Do we want it to be known as a a place where uh, it's a blessing to the community? Those are all good things. But above all, I'd rather cease to be known as a place where as people who inquire of the Lord. Because from there... Everything else comes. So we do that now. Should we inquire of God? Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you that we can meet you in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can know you and enjoy you. And thank you, Lord, that you're you're a Father who loves us. And like any father, you're interested to hear from us and you, you're off, you, you love to guide us. So we pray, Father, you would do that. I don't know what people are going through today, what decisions they need to make. But Lord, please would you guide us. Please would you open or close doors accordingly. Help us, Lord, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and trust that all these things will be added unto us. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.